uh, speak on uh, the CT uh, presentation uh, of various modalities, uh, of various uh, disease entities uh, when it comes to an acute abdomen. Uh, this is what we see in emergency radiology day in, day out. Um, Firstly, what is acute abdomen? Uh, it's basically a sudden onset severe abdominal pain that needs emergent care. Uh, the clinical assessment of acute abdomen is uh, quite subjective and difficult, and therefore we need the help of uh, some kind of uh, imaging modality or laboratory parameters. Uh, the reason being that uh, most symptoms pertaining to abdominal uh, diseases um, uh, they have a huge overlap, and the physical findings uh, and often the laboratory uh, examination findings are uh, nonspecific. Uh, the advantage of CT, uh, I think we are all aware of that. I'm just going to go over it. Uh, it basically gives you a global perspective of what's happening in the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, with the current uh, uh, generation CT scanners, uh, you can get uh, uh, the uh, very good quality images um, in a fast and non-invasive manner. And you can accurately diagnose uh, various entities resulting in acute abdomen, uh, thereby helping your clinical colleagues in patient triage and a timely intervention. And you can also help avert many unnecessary uh, invasive procedures and surgeries by giving the right diagnosis. I'll just go over the purpose of uh, this talk, and uh, it's basically uh, going to cover the common acute abdominal conditions. Um, and uh, I will briefly discuss the CT findings in abdominal trauma uh, at the end of my talk using a few cases from our uh, teleradiology practice. Firstly, uh, the most common surgical cause uh, of non-traumatic acute abdomen, that is acute appendicitis. Uh, it is uh, one of the top five diagnoses uh, in emergency uh, radiology malpractice claims. Uh, just to reiterate the importance of being able to recognize and uh, correctly diagnose this condition. Uh, also, the use of preoperative CT has significantly reduced the negative appendix rate. It's almost, uh, it's less than 5% now from what it used to be almost 26% uh, earlier. A uh, few case examples of acute appendicitis and the CT findings. Uh, this particular image demonstrates a fluid-filled thickened appendix. So uh, based on CT criteria, if you see a fluid-filled appendix uh, di with a diameter of greater than 6 millimeters, uh, you can suggest the diagnosis of appendicitis. Also notice that there is good contrast opacification of the CT, but the appendix is non-opacified, indicating increased interluminal pressure and perhaps obstruction at the proximal aspect. Uh, one can also see thickening of the appendiceal wall uh, with uh, increased mucosal enhancement. You may also see periappendiceal fat stranding, this dirty fat indicated by uh, the blue arrows. And sometimes, if you see irregular wall enhancement or you see uh, periappendiceal air or fluid, um, you can uh, confidently suggest the presence of perforation. Um, so do look for these uh, particular signs. Uh, also, there is a very high uh, positive correlation between the presence of an appendicolid uh, in a case of appendicitis with perforation or maybe impending perforation. So perhaps it's important to measure, uh, to uh, mention that there is an appendicolid in a case of appendicitis. <coughs> Some more examples. As I mentioned, yeah, you can see an appendicolid, uh, but uh, it may or may not be associated with appendiceal inflammation. 
the other uh, structures in the right lower quadrant may also be inflamed, such as the terminal ilium or the cecum. Uh, this particular image uh, illustrates the cecal arrowhead sign because of uh, edema at the cecal base, uh, just at the origin of the appendix, nicely forming the uh, arrowhead um, against the uh, intraluminal contrast in the cecum. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, appendical lift correlates with um, a higher uh, incidence of appendicular perforation and therefore uh, negative outcome in non-operative management. So appendicitis cases with an appendical lift should be operated. Uh, appendical lift seen at, in a case of inflamed appendix, uh, dirty fat indicating inflammation, another case of appendicitis with an appendical lift. Appendix is thickened, measuring 13 millimeters. Um, there, we have gone back and forth in literature, you know, debating what kind of contrast to use. Should you use IV contrast, um, oral, or rectal? Um, and uh, studies have shown, and I have listed those studies at the bottom of the slide from radiology and AJR. Um, mentioning that the use of IV contrast material uh, really has no effect on sensitivity, specificity, negative predictive value, or the positive predictive value as far as making a correct diagnosis of acute appendicitis uh, goes. Um, in fact, uh, even a non-contrast CT's uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity uh, plus accuracy is fairly high, greater than 96%. I, what I feel is that you just need more expertise um, to make the correct diagnosis on non-contrast examinations. And uh, this, uh, is, these are examples of uh, appendicitis diagnosed on CT urograms, non-contrast CTs. Uh, this uh, particular thickened appendix wall, some dirty fat around the appendix. Um, on the sagittal brief of mats, you can again see a thickened appendix with an appendicolate, um, thereby uh, suggesting acute appendicitis. <coughs> An interesting sign that uh, has been described uh, in the literature, uh, in fact, I was at the um, emergency radiology, the American uh, Society of Emergency Radiology meeting um, this September, and uh, there was another paper that was presented from Mass General on you, uh, describing the utility of this sign. So I think it's quite useful, and uh, you should try using that in cases where you're not sure. Um, and the scenario is you see a thickened appendix, you know, the size is between six, it's a, more than six, six to ten millimeters, but there is no fat stranding around the appendix. In that case, you measure the intraluminal fluid, the depth of the intraluminal fluid. So if this thickness of the fluid is more than 2.6 millimeters, uh, you can suggest the uh, that there is uh, possibly appendicitis um, uh, with a uh, fair degree of confidence. And uh, you can distinguish this from a normal appendix, um, uh, which is also, which can sometimes be, which can often be greater than six millimeters. But so in cases where you have appendicitis, um, and uh, you want to distinguish that from a normal appendix, the size is sort of, you know, just borderline 6 to 10 millimeters, there is no fat stranding, uh, you can use the CT uh, fluid depth criterion of greater than 2.6 millimeters. Uh, tip appendicitis, almost seen in 4 to 8 percent of appendicitis cases. Basically, the inflammation is just localized to the distal portion of the tip of the appendix. Um, and it's either due to luminal obstruction, uh, secondary to an appendicolite, or maybe a lymphoid hyperplasia. Uh, in this case, uh, notice a uh, normal looking proximal appendix and a thickened fluid filled distal appendix with fat stranding. Uh, the appendiceal tip measures 9.8 millimeters. So uh, uh, I also want to um, point out that it is very important to trace the entire appendix so that we do not miss cases of tip appendicitis. Like this one is a fairly obvious case, but sometimes these cases can be quite subtle. 
and uh, patients who have very long appendix, appendices, in those cases, uh, this particular entity can be missed if the appendix is not traced in its entirety. Uh, the incidence of stump appendicitis has been increasing, and this is primarily due to uh, increased utilization of laparoscopic appendectomies. And um, so if you have history of appendectomy, uh, do not sort of assume that uh, this cannot be appendicitis, since uh, it's quite possible that uh, during uh, a laparoscopic procedure, the surgeon probably left a longer than usual stump, and that has become inflamed. Um, example of stump, stump appendicitis here. These are actually the surgical clips, and you can notice there's inflammation of the uh, appendiceal stump here. It's important uh, to diagnose this in a timely fashion because apparently there is increased incidence of gangrene and perforation in these cases. Uh, and that's primarily because uh, the diagnoses often tend to be uh, missed on initial evaluation. Uh, cases of perforated appendicitis, uh, there is an abscess formation, a lot of inflammation. You can see the thickened fecal wall and the terminal ileum here, and this is a loculated, multi-loculated air fluid collection. Um, this patient had a recent appendectomy and has developed an abscess, air fluid collection in the right lower quadrant, a case of post-appendectomy abscess. Uh, another interesting entity is mucosal of the appendix. And uh, you can diagnose that when you see an appendix that's greater than 1.3 centimeter, almost uh, demonstrating cystic dilatation. Um, you may or may not see mural calcification in mucosal of the appendix. Um, and it's usually due to um, a significant uh, accumulation of the mucus uh, in an appendix that's been uh, chronically obstructed. Uh, Preoperative imaging diagnosis is important as uh, it can uh, affect the surgical management. Um, and um, uh, I believe uh, it's a conventional open um, uh, laparotomy, uh, open surgical approach is preferred as the laparoscopic approach uh, has a greater risk of perforation and can you can also uh, and it can also result in pseudomyxoma peritonei in case it's not um, uh, adequately or appropriately resected. Moving on to the uh, next entity, which uh, we are seeing quite frequently uh, and can explain acute abdomen, uh, that's epithoic appendagitis. Now, uh, epithoic appendage, uh, these are basically those uh, fatty uh, sort of finger-like projections uh, seen along the serosal surface of the colon. Um, and they can get inflamed uh, you can, uh, and resulting in appendagitis um, due to either spontaneous distortion, uh, ischemia, or inflammation. Uh, why we need to diagnose this condition? Because uh, this is um, a self-limiting uh, condition. Uh, it will resolve spontaneously. You just need some supportive management. Um, it, uh, if when seen in the right lower quadrant, it can often mimic uh, appendicitis clinically, and uh, CT is the way to diagnose this entity and prevent any unnecessary surgery. So uh, let's go over the examples. Uh, this is a sort of a finger-like fat attenuation lesion with a hyperattenuating rim uh, associated with the cirrhosal surface of the adjacent colon. Also notice there is a mild uh, eccentric wall thickening of this portion of the colon just adjacent to the inflamed uh, appendage. <coughs> you may also uh, see a central area of high attenuation, and that's the thrombosed vein as a result of torsion or maybe primary thrombosis resulting in ischemia or inflammation. And then there are um, adjacent uh, uh, fat inflammatory changes because of uh, the inflammation of the appendage. <coughs> uh, a similar um, condition but different from epithelial appendagitis is uh, omental infarction. 
where you can see a solitary um, a sort of uh, ill-defined um, areas of fat stranding, usually sort of a sort of a mass-like um, heterogeneous appearing fat between the anterior wall and the transverse or ascending colon. Basically, it's corresponding to the location of the greater omentum. And uh, the infarction is caused by interruption of uh, blood supply. And it's either due to torsion or maybe venous thrombosis. Uh, treatment is, again, supportive. Um, and why we need to diagnose? Uh, just to make sure we don't uh, end up taking the patient to the uh, OR unnecessarily, since the treatment is supportive here. Uh, another frequently seen entity is mesentery panniculitis, which is also um, uh, which a non-surgical entity. Often there is spontaneous recovery or maybe minimal uh, treatment. Uh, you can see um, some fat stranding uh, in the mesentery um, uh, with uh, uh, soft tissue nodules that have a fatty halo. And this, uh, fat, uh, this fat, fatty lesion uh, has mass effect. So you'll see this a sort of a, an ill-defined rim around it and displaced bowel loops around this lesion, a case of mesenteric paniculitis. <coughs> the next um, um, commonly encountered condition is uh, diverticulitis of the bowel. Uh, the incidence is increasing now uh, in urban India, and it's, uh, although it's more, still more common in the Western population, uh, sigmoid colon is the commonest site of diverticula, and therefore also uh, the commonest site for diverticulitis. However, uh, just remember that uh, the right-sided diverticula tend to be more common uh, in the eastern part of the world. Uh, so, uh, or in younger patients. So you can, uh, not so, so commonly, but frequently encounter cases of diverticulitis in the ascending colon or maybe the cecum. The small bowel diverticula are much rarer and uh, not that common um, when it comes to uh, getting inflamed. Now, CT helps confirming the diagnosis of diverticulitis. Not only that, it also uh, images the various complications and provides a roadmap for either percutaneous uh, or surgical therapy. So let's go over some uh, cases of diverticulitis and some interesting signs. Um, the most important being pericolonic fat stranding. Uh, you may also see mural thickening or uh, maybe this eccentric neural thickening uh, adjacent to an inflamed diverticulum. Uh, the, uh, a sign that has been described is a centripede sign that's a result of engorgement of the vasa recta that are feeding the colon. Uh, by the way, this case is also um, um, showing a case of perforated diverticulitis. Note, notice these tiny air loculi adjacent to the inflamed um, sigmoid colon diverticulum. The comma sign, uh, which is basically thickening of the lateral fascia, uh, it's seen on the left side, and it's as a result of inflammation um, of these fats surrounding the uh, inflamed sigmoid colon diverticulum. The various complications, uh, the same case again showing localized perforation, tiny air loculi that are extra luminal in location adjacent to the sigmoid colon. You can see pneumoperitoneum. You might see an intramural abscess, uh, an air fluid selection in the wall of the sigmoid colon. Uh, you may also see a retroperitoneal abscess, air in the retroperitoneum, uh, colovesical fistula. The patient had sigmoid diverticulitis uh, with resulting in a colovesical fistula. Or uh, uh, rarely uh, a diverticular abscess involving the left adnexa, uh, the left ovary, and one can see an air fluid collection uh, in this particular example. Uh, inferior mesenteric vein thrombophlebitis is another complication of colonic diverticulitis. Notice uh, the uh, tiny uh, filling defect in the inferior uh, mesenteric vein with adjacent fat stranding, indicating thrombophlebitis. Also a tiny air loculus in the vein. Uh, 
One may also see a hemorrhage uh, as a complication of uh, colonic diverticulosis or diverticulitis. In this case, uh, this uh, diverticulum is inflamed in the hepatic flexure, and there is also uh, this ill-defined contrast uh, uh, within the colon indicating active hemorrhage. Uh, no uh, oral or rectal contrast was given in this case. Uh, notice this density is similar to that of contrast in the aorta. Uh, example of fecal diverticulitis, uh, that's the normal appendix. Um, uh, this patient, uh, patient's right lower quadrant pain uh, is explained by the inflamed fecal diverticulum. Uh, uh, most surgeons feel that you need to uh, do aggressive resection uh, as a fecal diverticulitis usually does not resolve uh, with medical therapy. And um, when it recurs, uh, there is a much higher rate of complications. Some examples of small bowel diverticulitis. Uh, this is uh, a case of an inflamed jejunal diverticulum that has sort of indistinct margins, um, in, uh, extensive surrounding uh, fat stranding and inflammation suggesting localized perforation. Better seen on the coronal reformatted images. Uh, another case of uh, ileal diverticulitis um, with microperforation tiny diverticulum. Uh, in this case, the appendix was normal. Uh, Meckel's diverticulum uh, can also get inflamed. Uh, and uh, as we all know, Meckel's diverticulum arises from the anti-mesenteric border of the small bowel. Uh, it's seen as a blind ending tubular structure, and usually within 100 centimeter of the ileocecal valve. Uh, apart from getting inflamed, you can also, uh, it can also result in bleeding, uh, either because of uh, ectopic gastric mucosa or can also result in small bowel obstruction. A case of uh, Meckel's diverticulitis, notice this sort of finger-like structure arising from the, um, the distal ileum uh, with inflammation. Uh, before you diagnose the case of Meckel's diverticulitis, uh, do try to identify the normal appendix, uh, trace the uh, distal ileum, and uh, then one can be uh, reasonably confident of uh, the presence of Meckel's diverticulum uh, or Meckel's diverticulitis. Uh, moving on uh, to the next uh, very important condition that's accounting for nearly 20% of cases of acute abdomen, that's bowel obstruction. Now, uh, this CT imaging and bowel obstruction is quite helpful as uh, it firstly answers the question, I mean, is there obstruction or no obstruction, or is it just ileus? Now, if there is obstruction, is it a simple bowel obstruction, or is it a closed-loop bowel obstruction? Uh, CT signs can be utilized to diagnose the presence of uh, strangulation or bowel ischemia as a result of obstruction. And one can also uh, determine uh, the cause of obstruction and um, give an idea to the clinicians uh, as far as the level of obstruction goes uh, in the GIT. Uh, a few CT signs that can help us in diagnosing obstruction. Um, um, uh, firstly, you need to look for the transition zone. Um, basically, it's the point uh, up to which the, the bowel is dilated, and beyond this transition zone, uh, the bowel is decompressed. One can often uh, identify the transition zone by looking for the small bowel CC sign. Uh, that's uh, a result of uh, delayed intestinal transit. Um, and uh, there is incompletely digested food uh, that has um, uh, been sitting around for a long time because of obstruction uh, at the transition point, uh, resulting in bacterial overgrowth and giving the appearance of uh, feces. Uh, so look for the small bowel feces sign, and I think it's very helpful in uh, determining uh, the level of obstruction or even the cause of obstruction uh, when you're scrolling through multiple uh, long studies. In this case, um, uh, there is a small bowel obstruction, small bowel feces sign as a result of adhesions. Uh, you can faintly see the abdominal wall scar here. Um, 
Another cause of intestinal obstruction is intersusception. This patient had a jejunal jejunal intersusception. Notice that bowel within bowel appearance. Um, in small bowel obstruction, uh, uh, in small bowel intersusception, do look for the presence of lead point or in adult patients. And this patient had a lipoma that was acting as a lead point uh, for intersusception. Um, gallstone alias, um, elderly uh, female patients um, uh, 60 and above uh, can have this condition. Basically, uh, look for air in the gallbladder lumen or in the biliary tract. Look for the presence of a uh, cystoduodenal or cystogastric fistula and look for the transition point. Here you can faintly see the stone in the small bowel. Uh, it's difficult to identify, but look at the morphology that is quite similar to the stone that's sitting in the gallbladder. And it is right at the transition point. Dilated bowel and bowel distal to the uh, impacted gallstone is uh, collapsed. Uh, what is closed loop obstruction? It's uh, basically when uh, a loop of bowel is occluded at two different points along its course. Uh, it's usually uh, due to adhesions uh, or maybe an internal hernia. Um, this obstructed loop um, could twist, um, resulting in volvulus. And when this happens, there can be increased obstruction. There could be um, um, interruption of uh, blood supply to the bowel or uh, the venous drainage from the bowel, resulting in strangulation. And you can uh, identify strangulation on CT by looking for uh, bowel wall thickening, uh, the uh, concentric rings on the bowel wall indicating uh, wall edema and ischemia. Uh, these have been described as the target and the halo signs. Uh, this uh, elderly female uh, presented with severe right lower quadrant pain and she was hypotensive. If you notice, uh, there is a cluster of uh, dilated small bowel loops uh, in the right uh, mid abdomen with uh, a lot of um, prominent mesenteric vessels. There is also fat stranding in the mesentery and the vessels are almost getting stretched. Um, uh, and the bowel, other bowel loops, proximal and distal to it, look fairly normal. So this is a case of a closed loop obstruction. And the bowel loops converge on a site of uh, obstruction, uh, the point where the twist is happening. Uh, uh, other signs um, indicating uh, bowel ischemia in cases of bowel obstruction. Um, uh, bowel wall thickening, so look for this particular sign. Um, you can see um, hyperdense bowel wall that would indicate um, hemorrhage within the bowel wall. Uh, secondary to ischemia, look for the presence of interloop fluid. Look at the fluid in the mesentery. Again, uh, the thickened bowel wall, hyperdense uh, bowel wall seen on the coronal reformatted uh, images. This patient. Um, had a closed loop obstruction uh, secondary to adhesions uh, and had to undergo partial small bowel resection. Uh, so uh, remember that uh, when it's a closed loop obstruction and you see signs of secondary ischemia or strangulation, uh, the patient uh, needs to uh, undergo an operative management, unlike a simple uncomplicated bowel obstruction where uh, um, uh, non-surgical management may also work. Uh, Moving on to a fecal volvulus, which again is in fact a sort of a closed uh, loop type of obstruction. Here uh, you can see the dilated cecum uh, that is uh, located in an abnormal location. It's almost to the left side of the abdomen. Um, when you're trying to diagnose volvulus or bowel twists, um, the twist is happening at a particular point. So look for that point and try to identify these beaks. Uh, these beaks are basically a result of uh, the compressed bowel at the point where the twist has happened. So that is the beak sign, and this can uh, really help you diagnose uh, volvulus and differentiate uh, volvulus from um, just, uh, say, perhaps in the case of sigmoid colon, just a markedly redundant um, dilated sigmoid colon or sigmoid colon with alias. Uh, 
A case of uh, now hernias are also a common causes of bowel obstruction. This patient had an inguinoscrotal hernia that contained um, um, dilated fluid filled bowel loops. Uh, proximal loops are also dilated. Uh, so this is a case of incarcerated hernia with small bowel obstruction. Um, um, this uh, patient had uh, an incarcerated uh, femoral hernia with small bowel obstruction. Um, look at the difference in the uh, location of the hernia, femoral versus inguinal, um, and their relationship with the femoral vessels. Uh, inguinal hernia, um, quite medial in location. Um, uh, away from the femoral vessels, there is no compression of the femoral vein, unlike a femoral hernia where there is compression of the femoral vein. Um, I, find that, I find that fairly uh, useful um, in diagnosing a femoral hernia. Uh, we discussed uh, uh, some of the CT signs of bowel ischemia uh, as a result of bowel obstruction. Now, bowel ischemia could also uh, occur due to either mesenteric arterial or venous occlusion, or could be non-occlusive, uh, just uh, systemic hypotension resulting in decreased intestinal perfusion. Uh, occlusion of the superior mesenteric artery uh, alone accounts for up to like 60 to 70 percent cases of bowel ischemia. Um, venous thrombosis, um, about 5 to 10 percent, and non-occlusive bowel ischemia uh, comprises uh, almost uh, 20 to 30 percent uh, cases of uh, ischemic bowel. We go over the various CT findings, uh, which include um, bowel wall thickening, which could be homogeneous or uh, heterogeneous, or could just be uh, hyper uh, attenuating uh, bowel wall. Uh, uh, there could be a dilatation of bowel as a result of alias. Um, you may also get um, absent bowel wall enhancement. Uh, there could be a mesenteric fat stranding uh, as a result of um, uh, alteration of uh, the blood supply and uh, inflammation. Uh, one may also see pneumatosis, portal venous air, or air in the mesenteric arteries or veins in addition to thrombosis. Uh, this patient had a large bowel infarction. Um, notice uh, the, uh, the distribution of air here in the uh, colon and the uh, ascending colon, in the cecum and the ascending colon. Uh, air is also seen in the non-dependent portion, fairly linear, and it's limited to the bowel wall, <coughs> uh, indicating um, uh, breach of the bowel uh, mucosa and uh, air is also seen in the peritoneal cavity, uh, free uh, intraperitoneal air loculi, and also notice uh, there is extensive uh, portal venous air. This patient had bowel ischemia secondary to thrombosis of the superior mesenteric artery, filling defect in the superior mesenteric artery. Um, and uh, the other sign, which is uh, subtle, is uh, the fact that there is decreased bowel enhancement, bowel wall enhancement of the affected loop of small bowel. And it's also abnormally dilated because of uh, alias secondary to bowel ischemia. <coughs> An example of venal occlusive bowel ischemia, there is a filling defect in the superior mesenteric vein resulting in um, uh, uh, extensive uh, mesenteric congestion, bowel wall thickening uh, due to um, uh, uh, congestive state. Uh, other uh, causes of bowel wall thickening and other, uh, uh, another cause of acute abdomen is colitis. Um, so for colitis, uh, just look for um, uh, thickened bowel wall, usually involving a long segment of the uh, bowel. Uh, in this case, uh, there is uh, circumferential wall thickening of the colon. Look at um, the house through folds. They are also fairly thickened. Again, um, bowel wall thickening seen on the coronal reformatted images, very well seen in the descending colon with adjacent um, uh, fat stranding, a case of uh, colitis. Uh, uh, 
common condition of patients presenting with severe epigastric pain. Um, I've seen many cases where uh, the reason for examination is uh, please rule out dissection, and what we end up seeing is a normal aorta um, uh, instead, and there is um, uh, just thickening of the uh, gastric wall. That's a stomach, um, uh, distal stomach, and notice this uh, tiny uh, ulcer in the distal stomach and mucosal hyperenhancement uh, indicating uh, gastritis. Um, case of uh, peptic ulcer disease, that's perforated. Uh, the free air, extensive bowel wall thickening, and uh, mucosal hyperenhancement of the stomach. Cholecystitis, uh, commonly seen. Um, um, uh, in fact, um, I've noticed um, many uh, CTs that come in for rule out aortic dissection. Um, um, when the aorta is normal, I always uh, try to evaluate the gallbladder. Uh, the stomach and the pancreas. Uh, the gallbladder is often inflamed, um, is inflamed in quite a few of such uh, cases. Just to um, show you, um, uh, you know, that there is a significant overlap of uh, si signs and symptoms uh, clinically and the importance of uh, imaging. Uh, case of cholecystitis with thickened gallbladder wall, um, another case demonstrating a tiny gallbladder wall calculi. Uh, might, you might see a little bit of fat stranding around the gallbladder or some fluid around the gallbladder. One should also look for a uh, presence of any biliary obstruction, uh, biliary ductal dilatation. Try to evaluate the common duct. Look for any possible uh, calcula in the common duct in case you see dilated ducts uh, or um, maybe uh, signs of uh, gallstone pancreatitis. Moving on to pancreatitis now, um, uh, which uh, will manifest as uh, enlargement of the pancreas, which could be diffuse or focal. Um, uh, one can see peripancreatic fat stranding. You may see fluid in the retroperitoneum. This example, um, had, uh, this patient had pancreatitis and one month later uh, developed a pancreatic abscess. Look at the sort of multiple areas of necrosis, uh, hypodense areas, and um, uh, air loculi in the pancreas. Um, another complication of pancreatitis uh, is uh, formation of either splenic artery or pancre pancreatic or duodenal artery aneurysms. Uh, this is an example of a pancreatic or duodenal artery aneurysm. Uh, moving on to genital urinary pathology um, uh, uh, resulting in acute abdomen. Um, commonly seen a uh, case of pyelonephritis, um, hypodense um, or uh, high, uh, uh, diminished enhancement of uh, uh, the kidney, a few areas in the kidney, wedge shaped hypodensities. Um, with perinephric fat stranding, uh, look for presence of any obstruction, which could be uh, a cause for uh, development of pyelonephritis. Um, look for hydronephrosis, any distal calculi, presence of any abscesses. This patient had a subcapsule of fluid collection that's indenting the renal parenchyma. Uh, I guess I have to wind up soon, so I'm just going to hurry up. Uh, case of subcapsular hematoma, measure the density of the subcapsular fluid. This is almost 76 ounce steel units. Urolith is a common cause of acute abdomen, a distal obstructing stone. Uh, emphysematous pyelonephritis uh, seen in uh, diabetics, uh, uh, air locula in the kidney, and renal fossa and retroperitoneum. One can see ruptured hemorrhagic cysts in young females. Uh, with uh, presenting as hemoperitoneum. Just make sure the patient is not pregnant. Uh, usually get a pregnancy test before a CT or confirm that she's not pregnant. Prostatic abscesses, uh, degenerating uterine fibroids can also result in abdominal pain. This is an example of a ruptured aortic aneurysm with retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Uh, I think I'm just going to stop here since uh, we can perhaps, uh, you know, deal with uh, abdominal trauma and talk about it at length uh, on another occasion. So that will be it for now. Thank you.